Welcome to another episode, another video, whatever we want to call it, of Definitive Analysis. And this is actually a very special one. First of all, it's brand new. Here I am in the present day. Uh, it is a day off from school. It is spring break. I am spring breaking it uh, right now, which is really uh, kind of fun. Enjoying some time to do things like this, uh, which is start to put up some uh, work, uh, some lectures, some ideas about some stories uh, that I've you know, really kind of been, been working on for a long period of time, taught many times over. And today uh, is a very special day because we'll be working on um, a rose for Emily by William Faulkner, really one of his uh, seminal pieces. Uh, we see how much this is anthologized. It's put into high school and college textbooks all over the place. And the first thing I wanna say right off the bat is check the description below you'll find some links uh, to some uh, Yale kind of open course uh, uh, videos from a professor, Blight history professor, who deals with the time and era of the antebellum South, the post antebellum uh, South reconstruction. And I'm gonna put a, two links for two different videos, uh, back to back lectures that deal with the Southern aristocracy, uh, the antebellum and really good information. Way more than I'm gonna provide in these videos. I would honestly suggest watching those alongside this lecture uh, for this particular short story, or watch those before you watch this because it's going to give you so much historical context, which so many people lack, teachers and students alike, lacking historical context and knowing what these stories are essentially getting at, right? What they're giving us. So watch those uh, at some point. They're very good. They're part of those open course kind of ideas, which means everybody can access what these professors have to offer at these uh, prestigious universities. Uh, so you can watch that because it's going to give ideas about the aristocracy. All right. Now, a rose for Emily means really at her death, right? A sign of respect. It could also be in terms of romance, right? Getting a rose uh, from a man, right? As a sign of love and affection and uh, maybe some commitment to some future together, right? The idea of getting a rose. So it can mean a few different things. Let's get some things out of the way. Got a lot to say about the story, so we'll get right into it. First of all, let's check out the names. Uh, Emily Grierson, we find out, right? And notice the story is told in kind of a uh, present and then thinking about flashbacks and then kind of tying back to the present. Um, so that's the way it's written. It can get a tad bit confusing at times. Um, so we start right at the end when Emily Grierson dies, right? And later on in the story, we'll be at the funeral. We'll see some of the details there. So it starts off this way. Emily, what does it translate to? Rival, right? Like my rival. I'm the rival to someone. Wily and persuasive, right? Persuasive is an interesting word when we think about who Emily is, what her life was supposed to be versus what it becomes, right? The different roles that she plays and maybe wants to play and doesn't want to play. So a certain persuasiveness. What about Grierson? Watchful, right? It means to be watchful, right? Grierson, an interesting name, and we'll see this kind of, you know, how this is used later on in the text. Now, another thing we notice right in the first paragraph is that uh, men want to go to this funeral out of a certain respect. Women want to kind of go and see the home out of a certain curiosity. By the end of the story, my take on things is both are quite negative um, to give this idea, to have this respect for Emily and what she represents, to have this curiosity for Emily and what she represents. Both are equally horrible, right? Uh, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, we get into the next couple paragraphs here, right? And a lot of what these paragraphs are doing uh, is giving us description of the home itself. Um, what kind of home is being described? Here's where you need to have that historical context in order to understand the, in order to understand the significance uh, of this home. And this is a plantation home. This is the, the South, right? Uh, Jefferson, Mississippi, right? So we are in the, the deep South here. This is an old select home, a select family name. And this is a plantation estate where we would definitely have slaves working on the property, right? Uh, of course, as slaves against their will, right, for free. There's so much that you, you need to kind of mention there. Um, there is this idea of modernization and industrialization, uh, and things are modernizing on the street, and so this old plantation home 
uh, starts to stand out a bit, uh, almost in, in, in the way of being an eyesore, something that doesn't belong there. Um, I want to point out some diction here. Co uh, I'll just read this line. Uh, only Miss Emily's house was left, lifting its stubborn and coquettish decay above the cotton wagons and the gasoline pumps. First of all, we get this kind of personified means of describing the house. Um, a house cannot be stubborn, right? And, and, and even the, you know, the exterior and that detail of a house cannot be stubborn and it can't be coquettish. Coquettish meaning flirtatious. The idea behind this is that there is something stubborn and coquettish about what the Grierson name embodies, which is the Southern aristocracy, right? And you'll start to hear me mention that, that, that uh, entity more and more throughout this lecture because it's really what we have to be talking about. When we're talking about what Miss Emily represents, what this home represents, the Grierson name is tied to, it's this idea of being a plantation home. And there's something about it that is stubborn, does, perhaps does not want to go away, but also this idea of there's something coquettish, there's something flirtatious, there's something appealing about this home. Now I'll talk about this story as if you know at least some of the basics, right? And one of the key characters, one of the probably the biggest antagonist in the piece, if we are to have an antagonist, uh, would be Homer Barron, right? And notice that in that word flirtatious definitely applies to his character because he, in a way, gets involved romantically on the level of a relationship with Emily, right? So there's that idea of him kind of finding appeal in this home and what it represents. Maybe he finds appeal in what the home represents more than he does Emily herself as a woman, someone to be romantically engaged with. So think about that. What is really drawing Homer Barron's attention? Uh, and we'll get into his character here in a little bit and talk about some detail there as well. But there's something attractive and flirtatious about this house and what it represents. Miss Emily, it's, it's said, is um, uh, she will be joining all the Confederate and Union soldiers, this kind of anonymous grave filled with both. And I think that anonymity speaks to where she falls in all of this. Is she really this... Uh, um, uh, uh, you know, steadfast, willing uh, uh, representative of the old aristocratic class, or is she different, right? Is she something more uh, kind of neutral, anonymous in this grave with both of these soldiers? Because that's where it said she's headed, right? So to think about where her allegiances lie is one of the key parts of the story as well. Now, we get into this idea, very important language in the third big paragraph. What is Miss Emily? A tradition, a duty, and a care. A hereditary, right, key word there, obligation upon the time. Uh, meaning it's, it's kind of tied to their blood and that sense of um, identity, right? Uh, what ties them to this town and region, right? Feeling like they belong. Um, and Miss Emily and the Grierson name, right, her father as well when he was alive, all of this is very important to the town. Now throughout the story it's a bit ironic because we get this sense that the town wants change, that these new people, these younger people, uh, are starting to fill the positions of leadership uh, and lead this town in a new direction, especially because of reconstruction, right, things have to change. But we ask ourselves the question, and I got to give credit to my father, right, who'd be very happy uh, that I'm giving a, a, a lecture on this uh, material. He helped me out on this story so many years in, uh, ago that maybe that's not what the town is truly pushing for. Maybe they're trying to maintain some old status quo, some old traditional perspective or reality uh, more than we think, right, more than just because they're new and they're young. We think that they want to change everything within this southern town. Maybe not. We have to kind of read carefully. All right, Colonel Satoris makes up a story. Colonel Satoris represents the military side of the Confederacy here, the military side of this Old South, right? That comes with a kind of different set of principles and uh, uh, rules and a sense of honor, right? Once we start heading into the military kind of aspect. But he's a racist nonetheless. It tells us that he has an edict, kind of a law of the town, that no black woman, no Negro woman can be seen unless she has an apron on, which speaks to 
how we perceive her status and her her, her role, right, uh, within society, just as a servant, right? There's no other uh, uh, point to uh, that person. So you can see the race, the fundamental racism, right, that's built into the way this guy uh, thinks, and he has the power to see this into action. What else does he do? He creates a story that the Griersons helped out the town when they were in a state of financial need. And because of now, did they really do that? Let's be clear. No, right? They did not do that. Uh, he's making it up. Why does he make it up? To uh, support the idea that she shouldn't have to pay taxes going forward. Now, does Miss Emily have money? Coming out of slavery, coming out of the Civil War, where the South loses and the rules start to change, does she have money? No, she doesn't, right? And that's one of the, the, the uh, signature themes we see in Faulkner's work. And I've read enough of Faulkner's work, especially when you read something like his huge novel, The Sound and the Fury, right? It's all about the dissolution of the Southern aristocratic class, right? The dissolution. Once you can't have slavery anymore, once it's not a slave society anymore, how do you make all your money? You don't, right? And that's the point that Faulkner makes when it comes to these old, rich plantation families of the past, right? They have nothing to stand on. Um, so we, gotta, we keep that in mind. Emily has no money. So he creates a story, makes them look like heroes, also that they don't have to suffer in public even the idea of financial ruin, right? And the fact that you can't keep up. So he creates that story. I just wanted to uh, point that out, all right? So ever since then, even with people trying to contact her as we see throughout the story and, and get her to pay her taxes, uh, she just basically ignores them, right? And says, uh, she's been told the story. I think she believes it. Uh, it's not, it's, it, she, it doesn't say that she knows it was a lie, that the dad made up the story, or, or that, that Colonel Satoris made up the story right, for their family. She might really believe it, and she just says, I don't have to pay taxes because of it. Next big uh, uh, paragraph, right? Uh, they called a special meeting of the Board of Aldermen, that paragraph. We find out she used to give pa uh, China painting lessons. This fits that kind of depiction of a southern belle, uh, a southern young woman who has certain habits and manners. So much spam, so much spam. Habits and manners uh, of, a, uh, of this genteel class, right? This aristocratic class. So that's why we see this idea of China painting lessons. That's what a good woman in the home, working within the domestic uh, kind of uh, space, that's what she does, right? She teaches within this world of etiquette and manners. Uh, so we can see the, the lingering remnants of that from her life here, though she's doing it obviously less and less to the point where she stops doing it. And it's kind of a mix. It describes they stop sending their kids at some point, but I think she, she has a, a, a role in this as well. She doesn't necessarily want to do these lessons anymore. Maybe she doesn't want to play that role any longer. Uh, if we really think about it. Um, we start to look at the furniture. Uh, when they come and they want to talk to her about taxes, um, uh, we start to see this detail in the furniture. Um, I think the idea of the furniture being intact, the furniture being in good condition, that would mean that this whole kind of Grierson identity is kind of kept strong, or, or, or their feelings about being Grierson's, right, is kept strong, whether it be the father, whether it be Emily, whether it be old Aunt Wyatt, right, who really, I think, gets this ball rolling, this ball being this kind of separation from the Grierson name, right? Remember, we have the Grierson cousins. They are Grierson, which puts a question mark above the Grierson's we're dealing with in this story. How Grierson are they? Do they even want to be Grierson's? as time moves forward in this kind of mathematical progression, as Faulkner reminds us at the end of the story here. Um, but this leather here, as they come into this uh, parlor, it's all cracked, right? Everything's starting to give way. A beautiful line here. I think a very important line, we'll see this connected to some uh, 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 diction at the end, some phrasing at the end. Um, when they sit down, the dust starts to spin all around, right? And it starts to, I'll read the language, um, spinning with uh, a faint dust rose sluggishly about their thighs, spinning with slow motes, 
uh, in the single sun ray. And what we see there visually is a beautiful thing. It's so meaningful, right? I think not a lot of people have done this kind of analysis on this story, which is why I'm kind of excited to finally get this out. Um, this truly is the story um, that s had me, who finally showed me that there is so much meaning tied into each and every line uh, intended, no less, right, by the author here. And so many of us, teachers and students, professors, right, even these people who work at these big universities, they've never looked at literature quite like this before. So what do we have with this dust circling around a single sun ray? What this is truthfully speaking to, and we see this more clearly as the pages roll on here, is idolatry, right? A false worship of idols. And the dust in, the, in this story really starts to equate to, you can have your own ideas, of course. For me, it's going to just be people, common people, uh, 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 the common kind of rabble who lick in, who look into the lives of uh, the privileged and the rich and the elites within our society, which Emily, of course, was one of those people, right, within this southern uh, town, going back to the antebellum period, uh, the times of slavery and the slave state. Um, so what is this dust doing? It's circling as if to worship this single sun ray. And what is the single sun ray? When we think of this notion of idolatry and worshiping something that is false, that single sun ray will be the Grierson's, right? Everybody uh, idolizing and adulating over the Grierson name here. Right after this, we get a tarnished gilt easel. Why tarnished? Because the gilt and the gold and the splendor is all but faded away. There is no substance to it any longer. There is no wealth. There is no money. So that's why we have this kind of facade here, right? And we have Miss Emily's father, of course, in uh, uh, within that frame, right? Representing really what his life uh, was like as well. Not a lot of money once this slavery uh, society was no longer possible. We see the dissolution of this family. They rose when she entered. Rose is always nice to see when we have a story called the Rose for Emily. So we just look for, uh, not much to say beyond that, but it's kind of interesting. Here's the line that really, I think, changed the way I analyze literature. And, um, you know, I've really just kind of moved forward ever since. And here it is. Um, when they see she's a fat woman in black, some other details, leaning on an ebony cane with a tarnished gold head. Tarnished gold head, well, uh, we'll get to that in a moment, but leaning on an ebony cane, leaning on a black cane, leaning on black people, right? Leaning on black people for uh, sustenance, leaving, le leaning on black people for the free labor, right? Leaning on them for way more than that, uh, the moral backing. Uh, of a, a group of people, right, which we see, um, leaning on black people for everything as owners of a plantation estate, right, within this society. Why is the gold head tarnished? Because, again, it's fading, right, when we talk about the wealth here. Um, her skeleton was small and spare, but we have this immense fat that surrounds it. It speaks to a contradiction uh, within Emily's character, almost on this physical level. What does it mean in more... In, in terms of ideas, I think she is, her skeleton is the true sense of who she is, what she can bear, uh, maybe what her sensibilities are. What is all the fat? It's the expectations that her society have thrown on her as the last Grierson, the last individual who has to uphold this old sense of Southern dignity and racialism uh, and, and all of those ideas, right? I don't, it would take me so much time uh, to get into that. Watch the Blight lectures. They'll give you so much information, right? That we understand props up the significance of a character like Emily Grierson. Um, so much fat, it's obesity, it's bloated, right? Long submerged in motionless water. This gets to this idea that time is always moving forward, right? Motionless water means you're trying to stay stuck in an era that cannot be, right? Time is simply moving forward, right? It's almost like a, 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 just a, a simple matter of physics, right? And time. Um, that's speaking to this uh, uh, aristocratic class, the, let's say, middle class that emulates them within this southern town that wants to stay linked to this old identity, these old ways of life, these old world views and cultural and societal views, which there is so much wrong with. I think that's the point of the story. And sometimes that can be understated with Faulkner, I believe. Um, 
that there's something disgusting, dismaying, uh, uh, crude about that way of thinking, and yet it is harbored by this genteel class. All this racism and racialism is harbored. It's entrusted to the richest uh, and most privileged uh, of the class, and, and they're the ones fighting for this uh, for dear life because it props them up economically. It's such a kind of sickening and twisted tale. And I feel fortunate to have learned so much about it just through professors over the years, what I've read, what I've seen, what I've heard, right? Um, what people have shared. Uh, so it's, 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 it's pretty amazing, right? When you start to think about historically this, the past, right? And what the story is getting at. Um, okay, very good. Another quick thing. We can never see the real eye, you know, into the eyes of Emily Grierson. We will later on when she buys the poison, her eyes are like, Taught, right? Um, but here in the beginning of the story, the way she's described with all this fatness, it's even rigid and covering her eyes. So we can't really see tr through to the real Emily. And I think it's due to the plumpness, the obesity, uh, which is uh, uh, the expectations that people have of her as a Grierson. Maybe it's not doing her any good. Real quick thing. Um, the Negro servant is uh, given the name Toby. A uh, quick look up of the translation on Toby. God is good. Um, I think this is validated throughout the story. He plays nothing but what seems to be a pretty positive role. Uh, we see the way uh, the whites comment upon him versus the way the narrator comments upon him. Right. So I think there is a difference there. Um, but we'll see the role that Toby plays. Um, if this is a redemptive story, which it has to be, this is a redemptive story for Emily and perhaps even her father, maybe even other characters here, um, then it's good to have a character named Toby by your side, right? To go through this journey and it's so reclusive, her life, and she stays within this home. But notice she always has this character that translates to God is good by her side. So think about that. All right, so at the beginning of part two, uh, second paragraph, just important to try to read carefully so that you stay uh, up, to, up, to, uh, up to speed with where the, you know, the, the, the different timing of the story. Um, they start to smell something, right? We know by the end of the story that's Homer Barron's rotting corpse, right? So sometimes it pays with this story to go back through and you can match up the timeline a little bit more clearly. That's going to be the talk of the town. There's this smell coming out of Miss Emily's home. And what we know it is by the end of the text, that's, that's Homer Bar Barron's body rotting within her home, right? Of course, we'll find that body in the attic completely decomposed, right? Just the skeleton, an eerie image we get at the very end there, right? It's shocking uh, to think that he was up there this whole time. So that's what we're smelling here. I just wanted to make that uh, uh, clear. Um, there's a comment about Toby, uh, about keeping a kitchen properly, and uh, it's not much to make, make of, right? Maybe we just gloss over it completely, but it does speak to women versus uh, men's roles uh, within society, especially within Southern society, where women were completely within the home domestically. Um, so the kitchen would be there placed, and again, there's a sense of kind of etiquette and work and ethic that comes into the kitchen, right? It's just the woman's role within that period of time, the expected uh, kind of role. Um, so it's interesting, right, that we have that kind of uh, 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 mixture where Toby, as a black man, is uh, fulfilling that role, then, that ask, that, that, then we have to ask the next question. So what is that free Emily up for? If she's not doing the kitchen duties, oh, she's maintaining the Grierson name, which sounds almost like more of a Feel free to write it down. It's a man's job, right? At least within the time period, right? So we see that. We see Emily going from what is clearly a woman, a woman who is looking for a relationship, a man, right? And she has that idealism in her life. She has that idea. Um, but what she ends up becoming is, now we realize something very different, maybe even more masculine, more manly, because of the need, because of the requirement. Um, this is an important line. It was another link between the gross teeming world and the high and mighty Grierson's. Gross and teeming versus the high and mighty Grierson's. What was the link? The smell. The smell of what? The smell of Homer Barron's rotting body, right? And there's so much to get into there. Um, but gross meaning large, 
right? Um, in America, I think sometimes we get stuck with the connotation of gross as just like, ew, disgusting, but gross means large, like grocery store. There's tons of stuff, right? Gross. Um, and teeming means uh, like about to spill over, right? <laughs> like your glass of water is like so fill, filled up, it's about to spill over. That's the mathematical progression of the world and reconstruction and society changing and modernization and industrialization. That's all of that. And all of that is rubbing up against this old depiction of the Grierson lifestyle, right? Slavery, uh, the antebellum society being the center of their society, right? And this kind of uh, uh, icon and this idol, right? We get into the idea of idolatry, uh, uh, these idols of the South, right? And what they represented. Um, so there it is, right? There's something about that smell that speaks to this conflict of a world that's changing. And the Grierson's that uh, perhaps, maybe the town more than the Grierson's want to hold on to this old idea of who they were, all right? Uh, just to say it, Judge Stephen, Steve, and the word, and I guess the name Stephen translates to crown. Uh, I'm not sure what to really do with that. Now, I want to point this out. We do get uh, the use of the N-word. All right. Um, we get the use of the N-word here. And notice that it's to represent the attitudes and perspectives of these women. These women talking about the stench coming out of the home, right? And what may be the cause of it. And she said, they, uh, Judge Stevens says, uh, this is what Judge Stevens says, right? To these women. But it passes, you know, between the women and the, and the men. They're both very, very much okay with the language. It's probably just a snake or a rat that N of hers killed in the yard. I'll speak to him about it. Now, normally I wouldn't even read this line. But I wanted to point out the snake or the rat. These are, especially the snake, biblically highly antagonistic uh, 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 creatures, right? We talk about the snake and the serpent. We also talk about the rat in this story. And they can be uh, brought together here, uh, largely as this kind of antagonistic force, the snake and the rat, right? Those things on the prowl. Um, and there is this idea that uh, perhaps Toby, uh, the black servant, um, has helped to do something with a rat. Um, and we'll figure out who the rat or the scavenger could be by the end of the text. So it's a line that kind of, it's one of those lines that hits a little close to home when you think about the plot of the story and what we end, uh, end up finding uh, out happens, right? Um, you don't go up to a woman, the judge says, it's an old judge of the older generation. And he says, you don't go up to a woman and say your house smells, right? Um, well, here's the other perspective. Maybe you do. If you're really serious about the problem and you really want to address that uh, stench, you want to find out what it is, maybe you do take a more direct approach. So you notice here, feel free to write it down, that they actually take way more indirections to try to get Emily uh, to kind of change her behaviors or kind of fess up to what's going on. They never really directly, like really directly go and say, you have to do this. So maybe the town is more liable in the continuance of the Grierson name than they are to really put an end to it and make her kind of adhere to whatever changing structures they have in mind. And so what do they do? They go around her home and the important thing that happens here is they're in a sowing motion. And usually when we think of sowing motion, it's not lime to cover up stenches. It's seeds to make things grow, right? So there's that aspect. But beyond that, um, the important thing here is the emergence of the idolatry that we see here. Notice as they're going around the house and they're getting, putting down this lime, they see Emily, her silhouette in a window, right? And it's described as... Uh, motionless as that is an idol, right? Motionless. We have that idea. Remember the water submerged in motionless water, this idea of a motionless kind of silhouette. Um, things aren't changing, right, in terms of the ideas that it represents. Um, and uh, as that of an idol, right? Uh, something to be worshipped here. And we have that aspect of, of Emily, right? Worshipping her, her family, 
this lineage, the southern aristocracy, uh, etc. These men then uh, walk into a shadow of locusts and Faulkner is really, I think it's impossible to read Faulkner and not see biblical allusions laced throughout. Uh, sometimes subtly, sometimes not so much. This one doesn't seem too subtle because locusts we know is one of the ten uh, plagues, right? Um, that Moses threatens upon the Pharaoh and sees through. And then the Pharaoh, reading up on this one, still doesn't get the message. Right? It's not guessing, I don't know if he ever gets the message. I can't uh, tell you I know the end of it, uh, that particular narrative. But even after the locusts and eating up uh, everything, there's th the Pharaoh still does not free the Israelites. He still does not free the slaves. Take the aspect of slavery. Emily Grierson, she was a huge slave owner. Her family, right, was, was a, if you're a plantation owner, that means you're one of the biggest marquee examples ex uh, 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 of owning slaves. Right? You probably had the most, you have the biggest property, etc. right? So you can see how those ideas uh, line up. Um, old Lady Wyatt. So even... Even preceding Emily's father, there's Old Lady Wyatt. What does the name Wyatt mean? Brave uh, uh, act uh, of a uh, brave at war. Brave at war, right? Uh, and I think the war, just to say it, just to get it out, the war that I think old crazy Wyatt was fighting, crazy Aunt Wyatt. Um, and notice it's an aunt. What is an woman supposed to be? Well, we'll see that with the other Grierson's from Alabama, right? Uh, proper women, right? Mannered women, uh, beautiful women, right? Uh, uh, adhering to the styles and the fashions of the day, in fact, being examples of that, right? Think about an old crazy Aunt Wyatt. We don't get that sense that that's who she was. She couldn't be. So she really uh, uh, defies that idea of, of what a woman is, right? In the Southern sense. That's the first idea. But what's the, 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 the other war that she's kind of waging here and has to be brave? To start distancing herself from the whole idea of what the Grierson name represents, the aristocracy, the tie to slavery, the tie to indecency, right? All of that. I think she begins the fight of making sure the name dies out, that it goes nowhere, that it doesn't have this clout within society any longer, right? So she really begins that fight. And I think that's why we have the name uh, Wyatt, which translates to brave at, uh, at war. Um, here um, we get the tableau uh, that the town has in mind. Very important that the town has such a strong imagination and observance of Emily and her family that they have these mental pictures collectively within their mind of what represents them. And the picture is Emily looking pretty and white in the background and her father in the foreground uh, uh, cl uh, clutching a horsewhip. In the foreground, his life is more important. Uh, he is the uh, a barrier between anyone and his daughter. We know that's the role he plays. It's said that he doesn't let anyone be a suitor to Emily, right? Doesn't let anyone do that. He's clutching a horsewhip that is iconically the symbol of a horse, uh, I'm sorry, of a slave trader, right? The horsewhip, right? Again, sometimes teachers just don't know, don't care to know. Professors the same. And we miss these crucial aspects. We also notice it's being described as a silhouette. Get your recall on. What did we just have in terms of a silhouette not even a page ago? Emily in the window. An idol, right? A false idol. And now we see the male side of it. We just saw the woman side a moment ago. Now we see the male side of this idolatry, what, what we worship in men, uh, the elites of this Southern society who were strong proponents of racial and race, uh, 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 racialism, right? Racism and racialism, because they are kind of two separate things. And so this is what they have in mind. All right. But the town says being left alone in a pauper, she had become humanized as they think about Emily's uh, uh, changing circumstances. Uh, they know she's broached. They know she doesn't have any money. Um, the only thing that being a pauper, that means somebody who is dead broke, right? No money. Um, the only thing I can have a high degree of contrast to with pauper would be somebody like Homer Barron. Uh, we haven't even really heard about Homer. He's coming. Uh, but Homer Barron being a great example, right? Because he is uh, 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 seems to be doing quite well, right? 
uh, affluent. Uh, he has this construction company. He comes in, he does work, he makes money, he goes and kind of you know moves on to the next project. So that's a nice contrast, right, uh, to somebody like Homer Barron. Also, think about Barron, Barron, like the Baron of this, the Baron of this, you know, it's such a fancy title. Actually, a Baron is the lowest lord, right? And what does the lowest lord want to do? Uh, he wants probably, he or she, uh, Baroness, uh, wants to rise as much as they possibly can through this kind of ambition, right, and self-direction. Uh, so the exact opposite of a pauper, right, who's at the bottom in terms of uh, that status. She, they, they, they recall uh, how she held on to her father's dead body, didn't want to give it up, took three days. For me, this has always felt like a resurrection, and that's why we get the number three, right? Um, taking us through the full kind of resurrection, right? The beginning, the middle, the end, and boom, we kind of start all over again. And uh, what's being resurrected? She's being resurrected essentially into her father. I think the reason she holds on to the body as long as she does is she knows as soon as that body's out the door, she is the last surviving Grierson, and she can't be the girl. She can't be the young woman that she has idealized in her mind, right? She knows she's going to have to take on the role of her father here, right? Um, and that means she'll never get married. And does she ever get married? No, right? I don't think it actually happens. Um, she has another way of going about it, as we know, uh, but it won't be the traditional marriage. She plays the role of the housewife, children. The, that's a crucial aspect to this, right? If they have children, if, if Emily has children with any individual, right? Notice the Grierson name lives on, the reputation lives on, uh, the collective sense of identity that it brings to these townsfolk in this Jefferson, Mississippi, this uh, town in the South, lives on in people. And I think this is Faulkner's intention. That's a dangerous thing to have these ideas live on, right? A very dangerous thing indeed. And she clings to her father, right? Her dad pushes, restricts all these suitors that, that you know, could have come her way and made her a wife and kept this Grierson name going. What does her dad do? He pushes all of them away. Why? At least my, my theory, my guess, uh, because he didn't want the Grierson name to survive any longer. He wanted it to die with Emily, right? This, this would be it. And essentially it is, right? This is it. <coughs> After Emily passes. All right. Part three, she cuts her hair short, more like a boy, right? So we see this kind of transformation right away. Um, and a vague resemblance to those angels in colored church windows. And angels, I think, is a good description of, of Emily at this point in the story. She's not, not an angel and, oh, you're so sweet and you're an angel, but more the original idea of what an angel is. Feel free to write it down. A soldier, right? A soldier. And she will play the role of a soldier, right? She, she, she will kill. She will protect. She will do what she needs to do, right? We see her playing these roles. Homer Barron from the North. Another key point that many writers, both fiction and nonfiction, uh, have to make is that racism survived in the North, uh, uh, especially in some sections, just as it survived in the South. It's not some you know, wonderful line of demarcation in which, oh, clearly no racism in the North, the, the good guys in this tale. No, not the, not the case. And I think Homer Barron comes from the North as an opportunist, as a scavenger, as a rat. You see what Faulkner just did there, right? You get it here first with this analysis here, people. I'm telling you, you get it here first. Uh, and the, the funny thing here is you get it here first, and yet this literature has probably been out for, you know, obviously, right? We've been looking at this literature for centuries, decades, uh, it seems. Um, all right. A century, I should say. Uh, all right. But there it is. Homer Baron. Uh, we already talked about Baron. Homer Hostage. The name actually translates to hostage. It's Greek, right? Obviously, you think of like Homer. Hostage? Hmm. That makes me think of like soldiers and stuff, right? Remember I was just talking about Emily as a soldier? Okay. Um, does she take him hostage? Yes, she does. As a soldier, she takes him hostage. That's why she's buried 
with the soldiers, uh, as we find out early in the text, because she is a soldier. She is fighting a particular fight. What that fight is, you have to be able to describe that, right? That's where the analysis comes in. Your articulation of those ideas is so important, but you see what's being set up here. This is her hostage, right? Uh, okay, very good. Such a, such a great story. Um, now, this is an important paragraph. We see the use of the N-word. Notice throughout most of the text, the narrator uses the word Negro, which is politically correct, right? It's especially within this time period and even to this very day, it's the respectful way, the academic way uh, of referring to black people, right? And black being obviously very uh, much uh, kind of common term uh, as well. But in this paragraph with Homer Barron coming from the North, running this construction team of black people, right, of black men, we get the N-word. And he's cussing them out and telling them to work faster, right? Uh, and the black men are singing in time to the rise and fall of picks and people. When you close your eyes in this kind of imagination, hopefully based on real reading in your life, you think of slave fields, right? You think of uh, a kind of a throwback to those times. And that's what Faulkner's creating here. Yes, we're in Reconstructionist South, Yes, there's no longer slavery, but yet it still feels like slavery, especially with this man coming from the north through the sense of opportunism. That's exactly what Homer Barron is. I want to go. I want to get up ahead. I want to rise up. Remember, a Barron being a low lord, um, and he's doing it through the most despicable means uh, of still kind of taking advantage of a culture and a kind of lapse of equality. Right? You can imagine that black people, and you can read all about it. Read all about it. Um, still working at massive disadvantages, right? Because of the society that they belong to. And here this guy is kind of capitalizing on the whole, uh, on the whole circumstance, right? So we see what's happening here. That's why we get the N-word here, because it represents Homer Barron's attitude. We should be very happy that she kills this man, like a soldier, by the end of this story, because this is despicable. And if you've never had anybody take a little bit of time to point that out, I'm glad I'm doing that, right? Because one more horrible thing is happening here, and I'll read this sentence. Um, the little boys would follow in groups to hear Homer Barron do this to these black men, to call them the N-word, to cuss them out, to tell them to work, 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 right? Please write this down. It's the influence that this is shedding on the young generations. Time is always moving forward. Young people are always seeing things with their eyes and growing up and getting older and becoming older members of our society, right? Young adults, right? And they're seeing this and that's the danger, right? In a way, Emily rips this from the world, right? She rips this from her society so as not to have that persuasion, to not have those influences. Please write that down. Super important. Another thing, all of this tied to Professor Blight's lectures. Um, the aristocracy in this time period preceding this, right, especially in their heyday, they were the center of their societies, right? Um, they wanted to be the center of their societies. Um, you see Homer Barron and Emily eventually strolling down in an old buggy, even though some people are driving cars around, they want to get back in the old buggy, again, to throw back to those antebellum days, the halcyon days, right, of the antebellum South. Um, and they want to be seen. They want to be heard. They want to be taken note of, right? They want to be talked about. And to be honest, with a whole story like this, coming from a narrator that represents the voice of the town, we see how obsessed they are, right? We definitely get, there's no other way of understanding it, it seems. Uh, they are obsessed with Emily and her surrounding intimate partners here, somebody like Homer Barrett. A negative influence, this man. Um, they get into the idea of noblesse oblige, but I was looking at it last night, to be honest, and I don't know what sense of it they're trying to get into. What is noblesse oblige? Watch, watch the Blight lectures, he gets into it, but it's this idea that as a superior race of people, it could be anywhere, you can apply this anywhere throughout the world, but we talk about whites in Southern society, it's our job to provide for black people because they are inferior. And it's kind of like this self-fulfilling prophecy 
uh, where white people say they are superior, black people are inferior, and yet they, and, and so therefore they must provide in the most meager of senses, accommodations, food, shelter, not education, right? Not equality, right? We start to list things off, but the basics, right? And they feel like they're doing, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're filling the obligation of nobility, noblesse oblige, right? But it's, it's a very much a double uh, edge sword. Just as much as you could say there's some uh, uh, virtuous aspect to it on the same coin, right? You could say that uh, it's nothing but debilitating when you start to think about attitudes that start to persist toward black people, uh, uh, the black race, because of an attitude like that, right? Well, we just have to give them what they need because we are superior, right? It really gets into this idea of like an adult child relationship. Even though these are adults, black men and women, it's always this adult child relationship, right? So, noblesse oblige. Here, uh, we, after that, that mention of noblesse oblige, we find out if you're following like the historic record of the Grierson line here, there's a falling out between old Aunt Wyatt and the Grierson's from Alabama. And for me, this is that line in the sand. She doesn't want to be a Grierson anymore. She doesn't want to be the representation of a slave-owning family name that has this kind of, you know, dying sense of honor and dignity that they hold on to so desperately. Reads every Faulkner book ever, right? Um, they, they don't want to, they don't want to do, she doesn't want to do that anymore. And so she starts to break, right? And I think that's where we start to see it. Um... Here we also have a mention of the townsfolk always peering in on Emily and Homer Barron. And this is the, the, the idea, the image we get is that they're watching from behind their, their windows and there's a rustling of crane sink, uh, silk and satin behind jalousies, that's like cur uh, curtains or blinds, uh, closed upon the sun of Sunday afternoon. So silk and satin, these are luxury items. So the people who are looking in upon Emily and Homer Barron as they're clop, clop, clopping down the street also have this sense of wealth and privilege, right? Uh, that they might want to hold on to, right? It speaks to their privilege within society. Why would they want to change at all if they have this sense of entitlement and this real entitlement, right? We get the material goods here uh, that they have available to them. Very good. Um, they come out on Sunday afternoon. Sunday is a holy day. We should be uh, respecting one entity and one entity only on Sunday, and that would be God, right? And kind of religion, right? Ideas about religion. Uh, but they are now, and there's the idolatry, they want to be worshipped just like God, right? And there's the idolatry, right? Holding yourself way too high, right? Very good. Remember, there's like cars now in this society, and yet they bring the buggies out again to, sh to, to really try to. Homer Baron doing this, and he's looking like the father. He's got the horse whips, uh, he's got the gloves on, which represents the gloves of a slave owner. So he's like filling the shoes of Mr. Grierson, right? He's really trying to play that role and doing it in such a public way, putting everything on uh, a full display. All right. The town starts to, you know, the, to the, the town, as they talk about Emily and share their, you know, this collective kind of opinion, they definitely hit upon some key aspects. I love this one. Um, she wanted to have a touch of earthiness to reaffirm her imperviousness. And the earthiness here, I think, is going to be intimacy, right? Well, this really reminded me, because I'm actually teaching in the classroom right now, Romeo and Juliet. And before Romeo goes to the balcony scene with Juliet, he says, dull earth, bring me back to my center. Meaning, body, go find this girl that I want to hook up with. My body wants to be with her, right? Dull earth. Our bodies are dull earth. Our bodies crave what animals crave, right? Touch, uh, the, uh, uh, intimacy, closeness, right? That's what we crave. Um, and that's what she wants. And if she can get that once, then she can remind herself that she can be impervious. Maybe she doesn't need it. She can be stronger than that. She can play a different role, perhaps more like her father, and just have to kind of bear the weight of this name and maybe be able to shed it, eradicate it once and for all. 
but she wants that earthiness. This is the touch. This is the beautiful part about the story in terms of relationships and romance. I know we find ourselves talking about the Southern aristocracy so much uh, when we read this and we have to, but it's also a story about a girl, a young woman, um, who wants to be loved uh, and wants to be touched. Um, and that's a tragic thing uh, because she can't. Uh, and it looks like her father, maybe even old Aunt Wyatt, set a, set a path, set a course that she only could become a part of and become complicit in in order to do the heroic thing here, which is kind of end these attitudes that persist throughout her town, right? These racist and racialist attitudes. All right. She buys the poison. It's for rats. Who ends up dying from it? Homer Baron. Put the logic together. Okay, Homer Baron's a rat. What's a rat? A scavenger. In what ways is Homer Baron a scavenger? Feeding off the name, feeding off the power, feeding off the influence of the Grierson name. Trying to make it last as we move into the future. Trying to have time stand still and let the Grierson prominence continue to reign, right? That's a scavenger. All for personal gain. This would be a much different story if Homer Baron really loved Emily. It'd be a very different story, but he doesn't. We find that out uh, uh, here at the, uh, uh, in the beginning of part four. Um, so, he's a scavenger. He's an opportunist, I think is a really great word for him, right? And she's going to kill him. Um, she, this is beautiful diction here, uh, kind of simile. Um, her face looks like a light keeper's face ought to look. Light keeper. What is the Grierson name? If you look it up, translate to, what's the meaning? Watcher, right? Uh, or watchman. And that's exactly what a lighthouse does, right? It watches. It, it, it looks out for danger. And with Homer, kind of, you almost imagine Homer Baron being the ship at sea coming in. There's some danger out there, right? And she's going to do something about it. So she's very watchful. She's very, I guess you could say, she has this presence of mind, right? And here, she is a woman of few words, especially when buying rat poison. Um, but she, she can be a woman of few words because of this watchfulness. Her, her, her choice to kill Homer Baron is premeditated, right? Uh, she wouldn't do so great in a court of law, right? If, because the premeditation is there. But that's the beauty of it. She knows what she's doing. She knows what Homer Baron is trying to do with her name. And she's m taking the actions to eradicate this rat. You dirty rat. All right, very good. Section four, uh, Homer Baron, right? Could be gay, uh, could just be a single guy um, who likes to live the single life. However, he's not the marrying man. What this detail does for us is, well, however you look at it, is it at least tells us that he's not with Emily because he truly loves her. And he wants to be close and intimate and have this kind of caring and affectionate relationship with her. He's in it for something else, right? He's, uh, uh, end of this paragraph, it says, cocked, uh, hat, hat cocked and a cigar in his mouth, reins and whip and a yellow glove. He's, he is literally almost wearing the costume of Emily's father, right? Uh, and the, the antebellum plantation owner of the former era. He doesn't want time to move forward here. He wants to fill that role. Um, a Baptist minister goes, it's said by, you know, by the narration, goes to talk to Emily and never tells us. This is one of the great mysteries of the story. <clears throat> we never find out what she tells him. I think maybe she tells him she has a dead body in her attic and he keeps it to himself. But you can think whatever you want. That's just my thought on, on the matter, right? Um, he gets kind of stunned and he never goes back. He never goes back. But I guess that, you know, what, maybe, it's, maybe it's a confession. You know, Baptist minister, baptism. I'm not sure. Maybe she had a confession in there of some kind. Who knows? But that's one of the great mysteries. We don't know exactly uh, what, was, uh, what was said. The um, Alabama Grierson's, who are really probably the example of the dignified, right? These, these Griersons who hold on to the name, 
who hold on to what they feel is the importance and the uh, potency of the name, right? Um, they're under her roof. They uh, think that she's getting married, right? Everyone thinks that they're in town because they're, arra- they're helping to arrange this marriage between uh, Emily and Homer Barron. Emily buys him a nice toilet set. It feels like the maidenly thing to do, the womanly thing to do, right? You buy your uh, soon-to-be husband some of these kind of toilet items, right? These bathroom items. Um, they, they were disappointed there was not a public blowing off. I thought about that for the first time uh, last night in a, in a different way. I think that means like blowing off means like... <sighs> Like, see you later. Like, we all want to see, like, the stars of our town, Emily and Homer. We want to see them say goodbye and they kind of leave in a car or whatever it's going to be. We have a different connotation of blowing off. Like, to blow somebody off nowadays means pretty negative, right? Like, I didn't want anything to do with them. I told them to get lost, right? Um, but here, I, I think it has, it's way more positive. And they're upset that they didn't get to see that. But notice it speaks to this idea of a public spectacle, right? Putting the Grierson name at the center of public life, and that's exactly what the aristocracy wanted, right? That's what they uh, thrived off of. Six months pass. Six is always a great number when we're reading things endowed with kind of religious symbolism uh, and illusion because six is the imperfection of man and woman, right? Kind of speaks to Genesis. Uh, And obviously when we think about the Grierson name, the slavery, the indecency, uh, the subjugation of populations, uh, this is a people, morally, whites, right, who, who f- fit these conditions, who are in need of some kind of uh, um, uh, forgiveness, right, some redemption, some kind of redemption. Uh, it's said here, her father had thwarted her woman's life, so her dad had made sure to sabotage every possible event within her life as a woman, right, to make sure uh, that she never got married, right, and we ask ourselves, what do we... What a horrible guy didn't want her daughter getting married. Well, not really, because if she would have got married, she would have had kids and the Gerson name would have lived on, right? So it's unfortunate, but it could be a family making these heroic sacrifices, really most of it falling on Emily, maybe the worst, uh, having to be this individual gives up a womanly life in order to kind of maintain the name here, retain the name, but also to have it kind of dwindle and almost suffocate. I think that's a, a decent way of understanding and understanding it is to have it kind of suffocate until it is no more. All right, newer generation of the town. Um, but I think we need to be skeptical of that as mentioned at the uh, top of the lecture. How much do they really want things to change, right? These new generations of towns. Um, this is nice, boxes of color and tedious brushes. I love this. Um, no longer do young girls, notice young girls used to go see Emily to learn how to be girls, right? Learn the manners and the kind of uh, principles at play. And um, no longer do they go with boxes of color. Boxes of color is uh, this kind of strong vitality, right? Uh, This strong vitality. We don't bring life to Emily and what she represents anymore. Tedious brushes means painstaking, difficult. All the effort we used to have to put into uh, uh, propping up this image of the aristocracy and what it meant to us, right? It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of labor, right? And nobody wants to do it. Nobody's doing it any longer. And I think it was a, a two-way street. I think Emily didn't want to do it anymore. If you look at some of the details here, and as that starts to have an effect uh, on people being interested, just less people are interested altogether. Right? So I think it's kind of a two-way street. We are getting close to the end. Uh, I think by, you know, I know, I know it's a lot in this lecture, but by preparing uh, everything within the last couple days here, I think it makes a huge difference. I'm able to get through um, the material. Plus, it's not a totally, it's not, it's not a, a tremendously long story, which is nice too. All right. Um, one of the final images of Emily by some townsfolk is just like we saw earlier, like the carven torso of an idol in a niche, right? Um, and then, you know, looking at us or not looking at us, Emily's in her own kind of zone, right? Uh, how aloof is Emily uh, to the townsfolk's uh, opinions of her? I'm not too sure, right? Um, but again, a carven torso of an idol in a niche, right? Something worshipped within a particular time and space, the antebellum period, right? 
we are no longer in that period and she no longer wants to be worshipped, right? Toby, his voice is harsh and rusty. Um, I think not a lot is said about Toby, right? Um, rusty is an interesting uh, uh, description because we do get this sense of iron, right? Iron gray hair, iron door, like uh, you have to bust down, right, to get into in the attic. And here, even his voice has this rustiness, just like iron, right? Um, all right. We let in the, this is the last section, section five. We let in the women and the men to see Emily's body at the service, right? This is the end of her life, exactly where we started, right? If you go back to the very first sentence. This word does not speak well to the women. Sibilant voices. Sibilant is like a hissing sound which means the women at this funeral, the curious women at her funeral, um, at her service here, reception, um, are like serpents, right? We link that to rats, right? So serpents, this idea of temptation. What are we being tempted by? Oh, so much. But some of, maybe some of that temptation is being tempted by this idea of glorious families with glorious reputations and we emulate their prominence, right? We, there's something that we feel we identify with. The curiosity is deadly, right? This is not a good curiosity for this woman to want to peer into what Emily used to represent and try to hold on to that. That is a dangerous, I want to make sure I make that point here toward the end, a dangerous curiosity, right? Now, as soon as Toby lets in these sibilant voiced women, He's out. It makes sense logically when you think of the name symbolism. Toby is God is good. God is good it cannot be in the same space with serpents, right? Which is devil, right? Which is this idea of the devil. He's out. And that's it for him. She had a great companion, it seems. God is good. As you really start to understand Emily's character, the conflict she deals with, um, you can start to get that sense of how that was a support, right? In what ways was he there to support her? Something you got to think about. Uh, one of the last images we get is the father, and the, the, the painting of him is personified, this crayon portrait is personified because it's almost like a living thing, like you see in a movie, but he's almost said to be looking down at this whole scene, Emily's service, and it says uh, that he's musing profoundly, right? There's, he's getting a kick out of it. Uh, maybe it's because he knew that this would be the end of the Grierson name, right? Everything's finally working out. The women come out of curiosity. The men come in their brushed Confederate uniforms. Brushed meaning like totally clean. Only kept for these meaningful events. They want to hold on to the past. And Faulkner makes that point beautifully, poetically, here at the end, right? Um, confusing time with its mathematical progression. That's what time is. Faulkner reminds us. Time moves forward. Tick tock, tick tock. It's always moving forward. Even in these broader sense, the broader sense of the Reconstructionist era, we are leaving these slave times behind. Professor Blight reminds us, U.S. slavery in the South was the second biggest slave society the world has ever known. You probably didn't know that, right? So we're really, we're speaking about an entire era, right, uh, of time in which this was the way that that society was run. And now things are moving forward and these men are confused and these women are confused as well. Here's the poetic part of it, I'll just read it. Uh, these old people, to whom all the past is not a diminishing road but instead a huge meadow which no winter ever quite touches. It's like this beautiful halcyon days in which nothing ever kills it. No winter comes and, and ends this so something new can grow, right? Which is the logical way that things work. The bottleneck uh, recent decade of years, uh, probably speaking to reconstruction and the massive economic and societal changes and political changes uh, that came to the South, right? Takes a really ma it takes a huge violence to break down the door. I want to say more about violence, but don't know exactly what to say about that. But what does it do? It, it fills up this pervading dust. And dust, I really do think the most accurate way of understanding dust in this short story is going to be, it is the common people, both middle class, upper class, right? Everyone who emulates the idea of the Griersons, right? 
when we think about the former era, the antebellum past. And so all of that kind of becomes active, right, and alive when we open up this room and what it represents. And what does it represent? A marriage, a continuation of the lineage, right? Children having this grow into another beautiful tree of the Grierson name, which none of the Griersons ever wanted to happen, except for maybe the Alabama cast, right? Maybe, maybe they're cool with it, but not our Griersons, not our heroes, not our protagonist, right? And we find Homer, her hostage. That's why I think she ends as this kind of soldier, right? This idea of being a soldier. And he's in the bed, right? Uh, no voice, two mute shoes, right? The voice is kind of gone here. Um, he's been cuckolded. I think you got to think about this. Cuckolded means to be cheated on. It's when a wife and a someone she's having an affair with cheat on a husband, and the husband's been cuckolded, right? And he's been cuckolded. What's he been cuckolded by? Probably Emily and her kind of relationship with death. I think that's the best way I can start to piece that together, right? Emily and death have essentially had an affair, and it's led to him being the cuckold here, right? Um, beside him is the even coating of the patient in biting dust. Why a patient in biting dust sitting next to a, a dead Homer Baron? It's just waiting for him to come to life so that it, dust being kind of the common folk, the common public, the common public discourse when we speak about these elites, these uh, uh, members of the aristocracy, as soon as somebody like Homer Baron were to reignite with life and vitality, that dust would be on the move. It would be ad, uh, uh, adoring him. It would be idolizing him. It would be surrounding him just like that single sun ray. So the dust is always there, just like the townsfolk. They play such a crucial role in the story, right? Fascinating, really. Um, here's where we, you know, that major theme of being a young woman. Wanting. Uh, wanting to be loved. Wanting uh, to have this closeness and this intimacy. And guess what? She gets it except in a very strange way. Right, by laying next to this corpse night after night after night in this room that is made up to be a wedding room, but also a tomb, which is to say that the idea of a marriage, Emily had to put it to rest, and she could only have it compartmentalized in this attic space, where this is where she could be the woman that she wanted to be. Unfortunately, with Homer Barron, who never really had the intimacy in mind for her, and so she has to kind of do it this way to make it, to make it work. But heroically, she stops the Grierson line from moving forward, right? No kids, no more continuance of this name. The racism, right? The uh, kind of twisted sense of dignity, right, that comes with it. All of that is finally being laid to rest here, right? Especially with her passing. This is all found after her passing, right? We see how she's been coping, uh, in a sense. Yeah, the people, the public waiting for an elite social class to praise and emulate but thankfully next to a dead man. We can think about that, you know? This patient and biding public, when charismatic figures come around and reignite old ideas in our heads, think you can see how people are always waiting, just like dust that's settled on the surface, waiting for someone to come around and reignite that sense of ourselves, some old sense of ourselves. Make um, at the very end, when we get this shocking image of Homer Barron's body in this bed, right? Total skeleton. We are reminded of who we are. Flesh and bone and dust. Not a man, Homer, bent on greatness and scavenging uh, of a, on, on, on a tradition, right? That he perceives as kind of great and grand. Uh, now he is simply uh, a, a, a mere skeleton, right? Compared to what he thought he could be. Um, and she seals this desire shut so as to achieve a more significant purpose, to finally end the Grierson line, end the intense and appealing symbolism it has for future generations of Southern whites. It's so important, that idea of what influence this will have on the young. Right? Remember Homer Barron as he cusses out the black men working on his construction team, using the N-word, young people are listening. And let that be a lesson to us all. Young people are listening, right? Uh, when we shed 
uh, some of these mentalities and these per, uh, attitudes and perspectives. People are listening, young people especially. In a way, I'll end on a kind of a positive note for Emily. She has her cake and she eats it too. Um, hopefully not an old piece of wedding cake because it must have been tremendously old, but she gets to be with her lover when she feels the need, right? Throughout all this time and the only person who ever knew about it was Toby. Toby, the, the servant in the home, God is good, who knew what she was doing so that she could live out this fantasy, this idealized version of her life as a young maiden, right? Uh, who meets the man of her dreams and has this life, right? She got that. And of course, the most twisted, kind of eerie way possible. Um, but she also ends up ending the family line. And the Grierson name is no long, perhaps because of this intense watchfulness of its members. From Crazy Aunt Wyatt, starting that initial distance between the Grierson kind of families, and then the father carrying it through with restricting access to his daughter, and Emily perhaps having the toughest journey of all, um, uh, having these experiences with scavengers and opportunists uh, who want to raid your family name for the most vile purposes uh, and to keep that going into future generations. And of course, she, of course, she's the soldier who prevents that from happening. Thank you. Uh, glad I did this lecture. Uh, um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I hope this is giving you ideas you haven't heard about in your traditional classrooms and traditional places where you learn about literature. Uh, we'll be coming with some more stuff as soon as summer picks up here too. Uh, lots of stuff that I can start creating lectures for. Thank you. Have a great day. Like, share, subscribe, and do all that great stuff. Appreciate it.